You spoke about the psychological effect of gambling upon individuals and the very commend commendatory actions which your gambling association takes to deal with that and help those people who are addicted. My question relates to the economic effects upon people who gamble, particularly poor people. A philosopher once said that uh, gambling casinos are really a tax on the poor. What do you think your association might do to help those people who really cannot afford to gamble, to not afford to take that one chance to hit a jackpot, to avoid that and to keep them from falling deeper into poverty? That's an interesting question, and I, 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 I don't know a lot of the uh, answers to that question, but I can tell you uh, some of the experiences that we've had. First off, the average casino patron gambles about forty to fifty dollars. It's a it's a modest budget. Um, some people can't afford forty or fifty dollars, um, but their visits are relatively infrequent. So that forty or fifty dollars usually is something they've saved up for, and they're going to go and they want to play the slot machine or they want to play blackjack. Uh, the research that we've done shows that the more insidious impact on people of lower income from a gambling standpoint is actually lotteries because they play lotteries every day generally when they shop when they stop to get gas wherever a lottery might be i think the casino industry should work very hard with the lottery industry here in the state of ohio to make sure that both industries discourage people who cannot afford to gamble uh... that they don't gamble um, and, and whether it's Operation Bet Smart, which is the adult program that we've developed at Harrah's and in the industry, which says to certain customers, if you're not capable of affording this as a form of recreation, um, and we're very clear, I think it's pretty clear to most people, the odds are in our favor in the casino. Um, and, and most people have a pretty clear understanding of that. Most people, I think, understand that um, the odds of winning uh, a lottery are incredibly uh, uh, difficult. I mean, uh, you're better. You're, you got a better chance of um, uh, of winning the lottery almost by not betting um, because the odds are so minuscule for you. So I think there's an opportunity to work together. Um, we have used Operation BetSmart as a way to reach out and communicate to people that you're concerned about. Mr. Sartre, your organization is to be commended for its work on uh, attempting to deal with pathologically uh, problematic gamblers. My question is, do you have any program or research underway to deal with legislators and governors who appear to be pathologically addicted <laughs> to the prospect of increased revenue from gambling? Believe it or not, we've had to deal with them because those same people have a pathological addiction to increasing the tax rate on us. So we've had to learn to uh, communicate with people there. Um, I know you have a, a unique situation in this state where you have now legalized four casinos in the four cities that I referenced earlier, and, and there's a prospect now of uh, uh, slots at the track. And um, uh, I, I, I don't know uh, enough about that to comment. I, I just know that it's uh, a legal issue and a question uh, for the governor. But I would say that uh, in most states, gambling hasn't expanded significantly after the initial legalization. And I think most people thought that it would be different. So let me give you uh, the best example. Uh, Atlantic City opened its doors to casinos in 1978, and the only place that got casinos in the state of New Jersey was Atlantic City. It was a city that needed casinos in order to recover as a destination resort town. Probably no one in this room can remember when Atlantic City was actually a destination resort town without casinos, because it ended in about 1930. But they passed that legislation, and most people believed, I think the conventional wisdom was, well, it's going to start in Atlantic City, 
and it's going to go south to Cape May, and it's going to go north up the coast, and it's going to go inland into Trenton and other places because it's too attractive. The tax revenues, the jobs, the capital investment, it's going to spread. It's never left Atlantic City. Uh, and even in that state, the attempt to put slots at the tracks has not, it's happened, there have been numerous attempts, it has not happened. Same thing happened in uh, Louisiana and in Mississippi and in other states. Uh, Illinois is the classic example. They're dealing now with a question of whether they're going to have it in Chicago, but they've always had a limited number of licenses and they've never granted the last license. We opened the doors of Harris in, in uh, uh, in Illinois in about 1994, 16 years ago. Uh, there were 11 licenses allocated under the original statute, I believe. We had one of those 11. The 11th license never, ever was granted for a variety of reasons. Uh, but what's interesting is, I, again, I think people thought that it would get its foot in the door and then it would become so compelling and so attractive from a tax revenue standpoint, from a job standpoint, all those other things, that it would spread and it hasn't. So uh, I guess the one way of trying to answer your question is that there seems to be a check on this that operates in most states, that the voters and even the politicians, uh, the majority of them, say, look, we wanted to go that far, but only that far in bringing this industry to our state. Mr. Satter, the uh, Native American communities in this country obviously are big into the gambling industry. You haven't mentioned them either in terms of contributing to your organization or recipients of services. Uh, what is that involvement? Uh, we're, it's a good question. We're actually quite involved with the Native American communities through their industry organization, um, which is a, a sort of a, a partner with us, uh, not directly, uh, at the American Gaming Association, but we work very closely with them. In fact, uh, my former company manages four Indian casinos throughout the United States, uh, ranging from California to Arizona to North Carolina and Kansas. And we work very closely, of course, with them because they're a part of, of, of our operations, but they also help us fund research. They have been a part of our funding resource. They have been very involved, particularly in the early stages of one of our tools that I talked about, Emerge, the training program for management and employees that we've developed with Harvard. Uh, they were one of the early adopters of taking a hard look at how that could help them with their uh, Native American community. So it's, it's been a pretty good uh, alliance, and I, I regret not having mentioned that because they've been an important part of the American uh, gaming landscape, meaning that in a very broad way, that, 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 that gaming has probably expanded more into Indian gaming venues than it has anywhere else in the United States. 